ecosystems uh, who have responsibility of retention, cross-sell, upsell, UNR. It could be also individual focus groups like quality of service or customer insight groups. Uh, it could be front office agents, customer sales and executives, uh, whereby this application can be used as an embeddable or, or a plug-in component within their uh, CRM systems as opposed to a separate standalone solution. On the other end of the spectrum, third party entities like content owners, uh, content providers, uh, publishers uh, can also take uh, leverage of this kind of an, uh, intelligence or customer insight because they also would want to target micro segments. So the benefits are pretty compelling. If you look at the benefits that this kind of an application can provide to service providers. First, we talked about actionable insight, which can allow the service providers to develop products and services customized to needs of the micro segments. It potentially can open up new revenue streams, especially in ecosystems where you have uh, a lot of different content owners, publishers, website owners that kind of collaborate uh, in the communication service provider ecosystem because they would want to pay a premium for that kind of a customer insight that the service provider owns. Uh, Obviously, you can potentially provide better customer service because you're that much more informed about your customer now, right? And in terms of uh, direct benefits for marketeers, you, you can impact the bottom line or the top line as well by understanding the, the outliers in terms of negative experience and proactively fixing them, right? In order to uh, come up with highly effective and targeted retention offers, in, in order to come up with you know, uh, cross-sell, upsell offers which are more customized to individuals as opposed to broad-based. Because the success of broad-based campaigns uh, and <coughs> the spamming of SMSs, we all know. We, we would just even delete those SMSs even before we read it, right? So it not only hogs the network capacity and, and is a challenge for the service providers. I mean, they are looking for uh, better ways to optimize uh, those mobile marketing channels. On the other end of the spectrum, we, we talked about developers, publishers, brands. The key prerogative there is to understand the brand engagement. You know, what kind of products am I using? When am I using that? You know, for how long am I uh, using certain applications? What is the uptake of advertising? So you see advertising everywhere. So revenues from data and, and voice and traditional services are, are plummeting, right? So there are services, communication services available free of charge if you're willing to listen to like a five second of advertising upfront. So in, in, in business models like this, uh, the owners of, of the channels as well as the owners of the brands would want to understand what is the uptake uh, ratio uh, and what is the success of the advertising. And which they can hopefully use to optimize the customer touch points in, in order to you know, make sure that the conversion ratios are much higher than what it is today. So this is kind of an abstract, a, a schematic of, of how the solution looks like. So you have a whole bunch of uh, data feeds that come into the system. So you have on-portal, off-portal consumptions, voice and data consumptions, quality of service metrics, customer care feeds that come into the, to the event filtering correlation engines, right? Which, which does all the heavy lifting with the data and then creates the customer profile as an output. Now this is the most tricky part. Once you have the customer profile, you do the segmentation, right? It could be the static or dynamic based on the specific needs that you have. Now what we call treatment strategy is before you want to launch an action, or a campaign or a promotion and, and pass it on to the market, you would want to do simulations, you would want to do what-if analysis in order to understand whether it would have the kind of impact that you're expecting. You have a lot of history about your customer. You know that if you increase 50 paise uh, per minute, what is the impact on the call volume? So you know what the price sensitivity of the customer is. Similarly, you know that what is the service adoption ratio of the customer is. So, so you use the intelligence that you already have of your customer base in order to simulate and do what if analysis. Once you're satisfied with that, you actually take it to the market and launch it. And not only that, you also measure the response of the same and subsequently adapt your future actions based on the response of your current set of actions. So that, in a nutshell, is, is what the solution looks like. So breaking down some of these key building blocks, I'll not spend a lot of time, uh, but just quickly touch upon each one of them. The, the most key of the foundation elements would be the schema, the information model, right? We're talking about a whole bunch of different kinds of information that we need to store within the application. Customer information, demographics, psychographics, you know, uh, service profiles, usage profiles, uh, offer and product information, event information like CDRs, recharges, payments. So what we have done is we have uh, utilized our experience of dealing with telecom data over the last 10 plus years and come up with a very generic 
uh, what we call unified data models, which basically is not only a flat schema to just store activities, but also is a highly uh, interrelated data model that allows you to store the customer experience. Obviously, you can also extend it uh, you know, in order to customize it to specific operator needs. So once you have the target schema uh, available, then the next step is to actually collect the events from the source systems and map it to the target schema. <coughs> Pretty simple, but, but the objective is to ensure that you are actually collecting custom events at every step along the customer life cycle. So right, like you said, from the time the customer signs up uh, for your service in a customer care center or in, in, a, in, a, in a franchise or a store, till the time the customer reaches end of life or churns out of your network. One key point that I, that I should mention here is, is uh, the effective management of high data volume. So we are dealing with uh, close to billions of CDRs per day in, in, in order multiples of billions of CDRs as well as other kinds of transactions, especially for tier one uh, kind of uh, service providers. And obviously one of the key challenges that the CIOs and the CMOs face today in the telecom world is to manage that volume of data. So that's, that's one of the key uh, innovations that has gone behind uh, the concept as well. So once the events are collected, the next step is to actually filter and correlate and aggregate the events, right? So this is where all the business logic goes in. This is where you, you define the binding logic. It could be dynamic, it could be heuristics based, it could be rules based. And again, you can use a combination of different techniques. Uh, the output of which is the customer profile. So this is the holy grail that everybody is looking forward to. So this is what you kind of want to end up getting to. And again, the challenge is not to create the customer profile. The, the bigger challenge is to keep it continuously updated and, and maintain it in real time. So every time a new event comes into the system, it has an impact on the customer profile. So if I give my mobile device to my wife today, the kind of behavior uh, you will observe on that mobile device is completely different, right? The kind of numbers I call, she will be calling completely different set of numbers. So, you know, so it is very essential to identify false positives from the real activities and also ensure that you are actually maintaining this customer profile up to date. So imagine a customer service agent on the call with a customer, just hitting a button to see what the customer has been doing. You know, so what are the typical numbers that he calls? What is the sphere of influence? You know, what is the percentage of international and local calls? And giving him exactly the right kind of offer or, or service that the customer would need. Wouldn't the customer be delighted? So that, that's what it's basically uh, getting towards. So once you have uh, that, this customer profile in the system, uh, what you want to do is either segmentation based on predefined business processes or interactive segmentation, right? Where you can play with a basket of profile attributes and figure out what is the right way to cut and slice your customer base. Again, today if you look at service providers, most segmentation is basically perception based. It, it's basically as, as simple as executives, teenagers, you know, uh, early adopters and stuff like that. But very few customers or very few service providers that we have interacted with actually do segmentation based on data, right? So that's, that's very key. The other thing that we tend to provide is, is prepackaged analytics in order, uh, so these are typically templates of dashboards or prepackaged rules so that the customer doesn't have to reinvent the wheel every time because we have identified patterns of requirements and specifically for markets. So for example, the behavior in the Indian market is, is a typical behavior, which is a little different from if you look at Southeast Asia or Africa in developed countries where the market is most saturated and the, and the growth options are not that higher, uh, you know, the templates look very, very different. Uh, treatment strategies, is again, like I said, is kind of a staging environment for the marketeers. And uh, basically, this is where uh, they basically play around with parameters to identify, uh, you know, what is the right action to be provided. And of course, the final step is the action where you define what to do, when to do, what is the right channel, uh, whether SMS is the right channel or voiceover is the right channel, depending on the segment that you're targeting and so on. The last point is very key where you're doing close loop analytics, right? So this is where you, you basically uh, identify what is the response to your current set of actions and on the fly adapt the parameters for your next set of actions. So it's not static, it's continuously learning and building a database or a knowledge base within the, within the application. There are potential app, uh, extensions to this generic concept. One example would be handset resident components. Like if you have a smartphone like an iPhone or, or an Omnia or, or, or like an Android, you can have software applications that can reside on the handset that, that can track which applications are you using for how long. 
you know, and what are the typical times that you use it for. It can also kind of track performance issues and send it in real time back to the server. But again, one thing that you have to keep in mind here uh, is, is about the privacy issues and federal laws and state laws, we need to keep that in mind because it's pretty stringent and, and you might have to sometimes take uh, the subscriber's uh, permission in order to put such applications on the handset. A quick look at the market, in terms of just the size, uh, the mobile advertising or, or is, is about to reach a billion dollar uh, before the end of this calendar year. Mobile analytics in specific has seen more than 200% growth in terms of investments. As a software uh, vendor, we believe that there is a lot of opportunity in this space primarily because there's still no standardization, right? There are a whole lot of different point solution vendors that are jostling for a foothold in this space, but nobody has kind of solved the full problem. Everybody looks at a particular piece of the puzzle and have solved that. The good news though is if you look at some of the recent transactions, uh, you know, equipment providers as well as service providers have paid uh, big dollars to acquire some of these companies in, in multiples of valuations. So which gives us uh, the belief and the confidence that the time is right in order to invest in this kind of a concept. Uh, last slide, uh, key differentiators. Uh, like I said, there are a whole bunch of small point solution vendors who solve a piece of the puzzle, but nobody does the whole nine yards. Uh, our traditional bread and butter business is revenue insurance and fraud. For that, we already collect a whole bunch of data through our existing uh, customer base. So this application is just gonna be an analytics layer sitting on top of that. So we can leverage the existing database that we already have. And providing this, uh, this customer insight of the service on demand is something also very unique that we think. And we've proven ourselves in terms of infrastructure and scalability in tier one volumes like Bharti and Vodafone and T-Mobiles of the world. And obviously last but not the least, uh, the capability of dynamically uh, improving your knowledge base based on real-time response tracking is something that's pretty unique. It's not available in any vendor that we, that we know about. So that, that pretty much is, is what I have to my side. I would like to open it up for questions. You know, oh, I would just like to give you a scenario, you know. Sure. Because the data uh, is, you know, if it, the mining of data and providing it in a realistic manner so that it can be meaningful for an operator would depend on the quality of data. That's correct. Right, and uh, particularly in the Indian context, the quality of data is, uh, is in bits. It's a, it's a big challenge. That's yeah, for example, you cannot ascertain whether a guy who might be a premier customer in for voice might be just a, like a regular customer for a Photon Plus or a data card or something of that That's kind. Correct. And more so because when the, when the retailers or the people who do the uh, filling of the forms, uh, they have a lot of data error, exactly. right? In terms of writing, say, they sunset. They are very fragmented. Fragmented, user. because, you know, uh, somebody writes Sunset Mark, and somebody writes Parliament Road, and somebody writes uh, Mr. Ray, or right. somebody writes R. And so there is a, you know, the same customer might be, uh, same guy might be a customer for multiple services of a particular operator. Right. But what happens is that because of the fact that the data is being captured in multiple forms, and in a much more distorted way, uh, it's not possible for the operators to ascertain whether he has been a premier customer in multiple lines. Right. If he's a premier customer in one vertical, then he should be a premier, premier customer, customer in another vertical as well. So what is it, is there anything that you guys are doing which uh, would make life easier for the operators right. in terms of ensuring that the data uh, is much more sane uh, because you know, doing a data mining is like it's right, right. Uh, it's garbage uh, in, garbage out. If you're looking yeah. at the wrong data feed, as right. simple as that. So the, my question to you is that: uh, Is there any way or scope or anything that you guys are doing, which would uh, mean that the data which has been captured is much more saner, or is there any technology in your solution which right. uh, would probably correlate to things like Sunset Mark or Parliament Road right. would be defined as the same stuff, and Mr. Prakash Ray or Prakash R residing in Sunset Mark is the customer. same customer? And then gives a much more meaningful data um, data results, and give a much more better view, saying that okay, this guy is premium in one category, and he should also be treated in the same way. Right. Okay. Yes. The short answer is yes. We do multiple things. For number one, we do not rely on existing data warehouse or BI systems because if you ask me, I've spoken to hundreds of operators, and at least 90 of them have told me I don't trust my data warehouse. Right. So what we typically uh, recommend is taking the data as close to the to the raw source as possible. So we take data from probes, we take data from switches, and do the computation ourselves 
as opposed to relying on a system which might itself produce garbage. So that's why the, the scalability comes in. And in order to the specific technology that you talked about, uh, which we call deduping, yeah. because like I said, the, the bread and butter business that Connectiva has and had for the last 10 years, this is a new concept that we've launched earlier this year, and we've seen a lot of traction in our existing customer base. But our bread and butter business is revenue assurance and fraud. One of the key things that we have to do as a, as a separate module in fraud is to identify uh, subscription fraudsters, which is the example that you said. So if I am an identified blacklisted guy, I would try to come back to the network by providing a slightly different identity which can you know, fool the system. So we have technologies which actually do a lot of different kinds of matching. So fuzzy matching, for example, replacement matching. So for example, in the US, Will and, and, and David are the same name. So you would not be able to identify that uh, unless you have that dictionary maintained somewhere in your system. So similarly, a hash and a number uh, would be treated as, as the same uh, entity or the same character set. So we have those technologies inbuilt in the system, which we anyway used to use for fraud detection techniques, which comes in handy for data cleansing when we are doing mobile analytics, right? So number one, take the data as close to the raw system as possible if you don't trust uh, your downstream systems. Number two, there are specific uh, uh, technologies or modules that do data cleansing within the ETL process. And to be honest with you, that's, that's the most challenging part of this entire value chain. I mean, there's, there's nothing else, the correlation, the algorithms, the, the rule engines are far more simpler. Uh, even I had a, just taking more time, but I had a similar experience. I, I am a Vodafone customer in Calcutta for the last 10 years. I have a credit limit worth one lakh rupees because I use it for my business. Uh, I came to Bombay, walked into a Borega Vodafone store. They would not even recognize me as, uh, forget about a premium customer, I'm a new customer to them. So I have to stand in the queue for 20 minutes, sit down, give new set of identification and uh, prove my credit worthiness to get a 1500 rupee credit limit. And it's the same operator. And we are working with Vodafone as well. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to break down these silos. And some of these silos exist not because of technology reasons, but because of uh, political reasons or because of separate disparate applications. Because some of these operators have grown through mergers and acquisitions over a period of time and they have not really taken the time to kind of consolidate their systems. Sorry, you had a question. Uh, whether your uh, data analyzation is the real-time data analyzation? Yes, it is. So the operators have an option of doing real-time even correlation, which means that let's say I'm making call, right? So what typically happens is the call gets logged in the switch, and the switch would produce files. So let's say depending on the configuration of the switch, it might produce files every five minutes, right? So the, the service provider is an option. So you can integrate at the API level, whereby you do not wait for the switch to produce the files, so you take the event data real time as and when it hits the internal memory of the switch. So those are through SAP and EPTAM like protocols. Uh, the other option is if you can wait for five minutes. Again, depending on, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a trade off between the cost as well as uh, the response time that you need. So if you can wait for five minutes, it's also okay to give us the files in real time. So most of the switches produce files anywhere between five to 15 minutes. Uh, so every time the file is produced, we pass it on to the system, process it, and, and then start processing it for segmentation, for analytics. So it's, it's real time, yes. I'm asking in perspective of the law enforcement agency. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very much worried about the real time data analyzation. Sometimes the mishappening is happened. And after that, when they go to service provider, for that particularly data, they are getting the data so old that the investigation is not meaningful. Right. What my question is, is that if your real-time data analyzation is happening, and if the law enforcement agencies are giving you the target, words, exactly. date, or some area, exactly. so whether you will be able, able to provide to them the same time uh, connectivity or monitoring? Yes, and that has actually happened. I can't name the operator for obvious reasons. But it's an India tier one operator uh, because we store detailed CDRs for about 90 days, right? So, so if you give us parameters that you're looking for, so for example, you're telling anybody less than a certain threshold of usage in a particular area in Mumbai, you give us a list of MSI scale. So we have had such ad hoc requests that have come to us from our customers, but they are primarily originated from law enforcement agencies, and we have been able to kind of revert back to them. But if we were not there, like you rightly said, they would not have a way to figure that out because they would go back to the data warehouse, which is summary data, does not have the detailed CDRs. They would have to.